Hey friends, happy New Year's almost. Uh, this morning, you're going to get to hear from some friends of mine. At Harris Creek, we have a residency program where we brought eight residents from around the country to spend nine months with us uh, to learn the Bible, uh, to learn about ministry. They're assigned to teams and they're doing the work of the gospel here at Harris Creek. Well, one of their projects is to come up with the end of the year message. And so they're going to go through our core values this morning with you. This is a great message for you to forward to others in your life group. Say, hey, make sure you're, you watch this or if you're on the road, if you're traveling, you can listen to it. But I'm so excited for you to get to learn from them. And I'm excited also to see you back in this room next Sunday. So you'll be able to stream this at any time today. Uh, make sure you forward it to your friends. And I'm so glad you're watching. Happy Sunday, Harris Creek. Thank you so much for joining us. Whether you're at home, uh, in your car, or maybe uh, at the airport anywhere, uh, we're so glad that you would join us uh, today for New Year's Eve. Let's go ahead and worship together. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. No. Our first core value is authentic. And when I got the opportunity to speak on authentic, I was really excited because of the authenticity of Harris Creek that brought me to apply for the residency here in the first place. The more I thought about what I was wanting to say, the less excited I became because I started to think, am I the right person to be talking about authenticity to the church body? All the times where I've managed perception this past week, and the times where I've answered a genuine, how are you doing? Was that, oh, I'm good, how are you? And that wasn't quite the case being to creep in. And I started to think, maybe I just rework some of the stuff that our leaders have already said about authenticity. And then I realized that's kind of the problem. See, we come to church and we learn the Bible verses um, and the Bible stories, and we begin to think that we have all the right answers. And we go from this posture of, I'm a sinner in need of a savior to, I read my Bible this week, I went to church, and I went to life group. I'm doing pretty good. And don't get me wrong, reading your Bible, going to life group, and going to church are all really great things. It is also a lot easier to talk about the ways that we've checked the boxes on our devout Christian life than it is to talk about the way that we've fallen short and chosen sin, or the ways that we're being refined by the fire that we always sing about but never actually ask for. 1 Timothy 1.5 says, The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. 
make this year your year to be authentic. I heard somebody say the other day that we started to pray like we do the Pledge of Allegiance without much thought or emotion behind it. Just talk to God. He already knows your heart. Just pray from it or pray from, for it to change. Be bold in your life group. Be the first to confess sin or be the first to talk about where you're struggling. Show others this year how much you love God by how much you need Him. I was lost when he brought me with his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Oh, the sun sets free. Oh, it's free in me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. Oh, I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am, yes I am who you say I am, who the sun sets free, oh it's free in me, I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house. There's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am. Our second core value is biblical. 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 says that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correcting, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Everything that we do at Harris Creek, from teaching and kids ministry to teaching on Sunday mornings, worship, everything is filtered from a biblical worldview. And you might be wondering, why does that matter? In the world that we live today, there are so many different ideologies telling us how to think about money, how to think about sex, how to think about parenting, how to think about school. And we simply believe that God in His kindness has given us a better way to think and process through those things, being His Word. So what should we do about that going into 2024? Two things. One, we should be aware. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6, when he's warning us about spiritual warfare, tells us, hey, be aware of these things. There's a war going on. And then he gives us the armor of God that we are to stand in so we can stand against the schemes of the enemy. Out of all the armor that he mentions, only one of them is an offensive weapon, being the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So one, we should be aware of the war that is going on around us. And the second thing is we should be ready. In Matthew 4, there's a story of Jesus right after he got baptized where he's, he's tempted. And he goes into the desert and he's fasting. And we're told that the tempter comes up with three temptations to take Jesus out early in his ministry. And Jesus responds from three memory verses from Deuteronomy. And in the moment where he was tempted, Jesus responded with the word of God. And, and we believe that the only way that we're, that we're going to look back on 2024 and say, hey, this was a great year, is if we know the word of God, if, if we learn to love God. And the heart can only love what the mind knows. So this year, what does it look like for you to know God's Word? We offer the Bible reading plan. There's so many great resources out there. Don't let this be the year that you look back on and say, I wish I would have learned the Word of God better. Community. What is community? Community is knowing and being known by fellow believers. Community is walking alongside people who sharpen you, encourage you, and bear your burdens with you. Community is the backbone of the church and essential for us to properly live out our faith. After being captured by Christ, community is what took me from being dead in my sin to walking in freedom, and is still one of the main ways that I see the Lord's provision over my life. In Genesis 1, we see the way that the Lord created us to live relationally, first with Him, and second with others. In Genesis 2, we see how God gave Adam Eve because it's not good for man to live alone. Harris Creek believes in the importance of community and wants each one of us to become a fully formed disciple of Jesus, which is why there's such an emphasis on life group and membership. 
Something unique and powerful about Harris Creek and truly the way that they lead out is the way that they challenge us and equip us to fully walk out of freedom from sin through confession. So how can we better live out biblical community for 2024? First, go all in. If you're not already sold out and bought into your life group, now is the time. Serve one another not out of selfish ambition, but out of love. For even Jesus came to this earth not to be served, but to serve. Hebrews 10.24 says, And let us consider how we may love one another and spur each other on in good deeds. How can you intentionally live out community this year? Second, stand in humility and confession. People don't know how to accurately love you unless they know what's going on behind closed doors. In order to heal, he must reveal. So that brings us to our fourth core value as a church, devoted. What does it mean to be fully devoted? It means that we first need to start with God's view of us. A lot of times we can buy this idea, if we're more devoted, the more God loves us. And that's the furthest thing from the truth. God loves you that why does that matter that matters because you only get one life James 4 tells us that life is a vapor you're here for a moment and then you are gone and so we don't want you to waste your life we think that God has given us his word to show us the way that we ought to live not to harm us and to hinder us but to set us free so that we can live a life that flourishes and that actually means something that has a purpose and so we we do this, we live a life that's devoted. By first, we, we need to have the Word of God written on our hearts. We need to meditate on it day and night. We sit in it and we remind ourselves the promises of God, that He loves us, that He's good, and that He cares about you. So because of God's love for you, we want you to see that following Jesus, that affects every part of your life. And we do that by first meditating on his word and when we meditate on his word that changes our minds that helps us to not be conformed to the pattern of this world but to know what his will is his good perfect and pleasing will what does it mean to be grace-filled first let's start and define grace grace is the undeserved kindness of god ephesians 2 8 and 9 says for by grace you have been saved it is not of your own doing it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The emphasis on this verse is that it is a free gift of God given out of pure love, not out of anything that we can do. Once we understand this, God's grace should affect our whole lives. It should affect everything that we do. Ephesians 2.1 says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Continuing in verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Grace gives us the victory over our sins when we allow Jesus Christ, the embodiment of true grace, to rule and reign over our lives. As recipients of God's grace, we are now called to be gracious to others. In Ephesians 4.32, Paul calls us to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, and forgive one another as God in Christ forgives us. I want to challenge you to be extenders of God's grace this year. This starts by being gracious in our life groups, in your marriages, and with your children. Because of Christ, grace, and truth-filled life on this earth, and the achievement on the cross, we now are called ambassadors for Christ.
our hearts adore. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one our hearts adore. The next core value is innovative. I remember the first time I understood the gospel of Jesus. Um, I was at the time 22, living in Michigan, and I was I grew up in church. I grew up going to Sunday school, and I was confirmed in the eighth grade. After that, our family joined the ENC club, also known as Easter and Christmas, and that's when you go to church on Easter and Christmas, live however you like, the rest of the year, and then call yourself a Christian. Now, at the age of 22. A friend of mine shared a podcast on Instagram, and I clicked on it. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a professional podcast about cleaning out your closet, because that's what the title of the episode was. It turned out to be a sermon from a ministry just up the road in Dallas. God used a sermon from a thousand miles away to illuminate my heart to the gospel of Christ. Paul said to his church in Corinth, in, Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 9, he said, to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Paul was willing to adapt to any culture, any city, to share the good news of Jesus. In Acts 17, Paul traveled to Athens, where the people there were really religious. They, they had altars to all these little g-gods, and Paul noticed that one of them said, to the unknown god and he was willing to tell them who that God was. It was Jesus. Paul didn't ridicule them. He even quotes their philosophers and poets. In Acts 17, it says, Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed. And those are the three reactions that can happen when we share our faith. And we should be innovative when we share our faith. We should come up with new ways to share with family and friends, or as family, or as a life group. And the three reactions we get, we can get mocked, so we can join in Christ's sufferings. People might want to ask us more questions, so we can join in teaching. Or, they might become a believer, and it'll be a party in heaven. How could I express all oh, my gratitude? I could sing this song as I own every song. So I'll throw up my hand and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is a hallelujah, a hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else than for a king, except for a heart singing. Come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on the lift of your song. You've got a lion inside of the mind. Get up and praise the Lord. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Yes, I do. Ah. Uh -huh. 
The seventh core value is missional. Luke 19.10 says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. As Christ followers, we must follow in the footsteps of Jesus and go out daily to seek and save the lost. We have to step into our God-given purpose and our God-given potential when seeking the one who doesn't know Jesus. God loved us so much that He sent His one and only Son to die on a cross so that we may spend eternity with Him in heaven. And now we get to partner with the Holy Spirit and extend that same kind of love to someone who's never experienced it. Being missional doesn't have to be going global or going to another state because being missional means spreading the good news of Jesus wherever your two feet are planted. God created you for this. Take a moment to think of the time that someone extended that love to you when they shared the gospel with you. And now I want you to take that and get motivated to spread the gospel this New Year's and to seek and to save the lost wherever you go. If you don't know where to start, I have two simple questions for you. The first one being, on a scale from 1 to 10, 1 being not so sure and 10 being absolutely certain, if you died today, how certain would you be that you're going to heaven? And the second one is, if you were standing before God and He asked, why should I let you in, what would you say? And now as you go into the new year, partner with the Holy Spirit and open your eyes. And I promise you that you'll be surprised how many people are put in your path. Our eight core value is prayerful. And I remember in staff meeting, JP said, when I get to heaven, I will be really disappointed if I ask God, hey, why don't you heal that disease? And he because you never asked for it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 said this, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is working within us. Imagine if I was to give you according to my riches, I'll be able to give you like $10, right? But imagine Elon Musk giving you according to his riches, he'll be able to give you like a million dollars, right? Now imagine God who created everything in the universe, giving to you according to his riches, according to his power. Paul is saying here, God can give you so much more than you can, you can even, even think or imagine. God is a God who gives generously. So in 2024, I want to challenge you to pray bold prayers. Y'all right. sing this with me. He's worthy of it all. Creek. Thank you all so much for joining us. We loved getting to have you right here with us as we're around the fire, looking back on what all God has done over the year and looking forward into how we can incorporate our church values into 2024. Y'all have a great day and happy new year.